Hello class! Today we're going to discuss Noel Carroll's solution to the paradox of horror. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. What is Carroll's proposed solution to the paradox of horror? 2. What is wrong with a flat denial of assumption 3 in the paradox of horror? 3. What is wrong with appealing to the mere idea of a thrill or rush to explain the denial of 3? 4. How does Carroll analyze horror fiction in terms of Aristotelian catharsis? 5. What is the non-narrative horror objection to Carroll's proposed solution? Okay, as always, when I give the answers to these questions, you'll want to pause the video so that you can write them down, type them up, crochet them into a sweater, hammer them into an ice sculpture, however it is that you best compartmentalize the information. If you recall, the paradox of horror is a puzzle in aesthetics which is an inconsistent triad, that is, three assumptions, individually plausible, but which together imply a contradiction. Those assumptions are, first, audiences enjoy horror fiction for its distinctive genre-defining characteristic, secondly, that that distinctive genre-defining characteristic is that of frightening and disgusting the audience, and finally, that audiences don't like being frightened and disgusted. Now, We've already looked at the way in which Freudians deny the first assumption, and the way in which Lovecraft and Romantics deny the second. When we talk about Noel Carroll's denial of this third one, we're going to appeal to certain ideas from Aristotle. Now, very frequently, when you present someone with this puzzle, this paradox of horror, they immediately go towards denying three. They immediately say, in other words, that of course audiences love being frightened and disgusted, Aren't horror movies proof of that? In other words, they embark on a flat denial of three. Flat in the sense that there's no additional explanation for the denial, they just say that three is wrong and that's that. Now the problem with a flat denial of three is that you can easily demonstrate that in some important sense, people don't like being frightened and they don't like being disgusted. Ask yourself the question, do you ever go over to the garbage and lift up the lid and just look inside to gross yourself out? No? Why not? Well, it's because you don't want to be grossed out. If you're sitting in a room and someone is violently sick and they start to vomit everywhere and it's really gross and it smells really bad, do you say, yeah, this is fun, and you stick around? No? Why not? Well, it's because being grossed out, being disgusted, is unpleasant. Likewise, if you're, say, flying on an airplane and you suddenly encounter severe turbulence, so severe that it seems like the plane might be in danger, do you think that that's fun? Well, no, it's very, very unpleasant. Fear and disgust are unpleasant emotions to feel. We don't normally enjoy them. We are averse to things which cause us disgust and which cause us fear precisely on the basis that they frighten and disgust us. So a flat denial of three fails to acknowledge that fright and disgust are in some sense intrinsically negative emotions, that we don't like them. And the fact that we don't like them is what makes three intuitive. Now, after a flat denial of three, the next most popular response to the paradox of horror is a denial of three that appeals to the notion of a thrill or a rush. People will say they don't actually like being in the presence of something contaminating and gross, and they don't actually like being in danger, but what they do like is the thrill or the rush of just a little bit of danger. So there's this appeal to the idea of a thrill or a rush that you get from controlled amounts of danger and controlled amounts of disgust, and that's why people like horror fiction. It's because there's a thrill or a rush that you get from the sensation of being horrified. Now, the problem with appealing to the idea of a thrill or a rush in order to explain why audiences enjoy horror fiction, or rather, why they enjoy being frightened and disgusted, is that it's not specific enough. There are, after all, many ways to get a thrill or a rush in life. You can ride roller coasters, you can eat incredibly spicy food, you can spin around, you can take various substances that alter your consciousness. There are all kinds of ways to get a thrill or a rush. Why horror? Why horror fiction? Why a specific genre of art that is 
interminably devoted to the idea of a monster and to frightening and disgusting audiences with that monster. Why that? Saying that it gives us a rush or a thrill isn't specific enough. That's the problem with just saying, well, we like the rush, or well, we like the thrill. Why horror? Now, in answer to the question, why horror, Carroll appeals to the idea of Aristotelian catharsis. What's that? Well, catharsis comes from the term kathar, meaning to clean or to make pure. Uh, we get the word cathedral, for instance, from this, as well as the name Catherine. Aristotelian catharsis is often characterized as a release of tension, a certain kind of relaxation of emotional tension. And in the course of solving a puzzle that the paradox of horror is historically based on, namely the Aristotelian paradox of tragedy, Aristotle explained that what a tragedy does is it generates a great deal of emotional tension within us and adds to some emotional tensions that we may already have, and then, at a precise sort of moment or for the duration of one of the episodes in the tragedy, that emotional tension is released by a certain identification with a resolution or with some state of affairs that occurs in the tragedy. Carroll adopts this approach and specifically focuses on the structure of most horror fiction. He argues that most horror fiction is a discovery narrative in which first there is the onset, namely the monster's presence becomes known, either directly or indirectly, and then there's the protagonist discovering the monster, then there's what's called the confirmation, when the protagonist attempts to convince the relevant authorities that the monster is real, trying to call up the police, only to find them not take seriously the idea of a leprechaun, trying to get the local clergy, only for them not to take serious the idea of a possession, trying to get your friends to acknowledge that something weird is going on and faced with their skepticism. There's a struggle to convince the people who need to know that the monster is real. And as that reticence to believe ratchets up, so does the monster's danger. The monster grows more and more powerful, claiming more victims, as the protagonist is trying to say, don't you see, don't you see, we're facing a monster, we need to rally. Now we, the audience, identify with that protagonist. We identify with the struggle, the desperate attempt to try to portray the monster's reality and to convince people to confront it and fight it. And then, says Carol, there comes a moment in the narrative where the monster is truly confronted and the tension is released. Often with the death of the monster or the destruction of the monster, but sometimes, as in Night of the Living Dead, spoilers, with the destruction of the protagonists themselves. Carol's idea is that a discovery narrative involving a monster generates a certain kind of tension, and that confrontation with that monster releases that tension. The monster is a crucial ingredient of this arrangement. So in that sense, it does speak to the question, why horror? A roller coaster doesn't have a monster that you discover and confront, nor do most other things that you might seek for a thrill. If we could summarize Carol's approach to horror fiction, we would say this. Everything's about the plot structure. The plot structure is what allows us to enjoy being frightened and disgusted. Normally we don't like being frightened and disgusted, but if the fright and disgust is the result of a certain kind of plot structure, that we're engaged in that involves tension and release, well then we're okay with it. It still is a way of explaining how we enjoy being frightened and disgusted, but it's a way of explaining how we enjoy being frightened and disgusted by appeal to a certain kind of structure that the fright and disgust can be a part of. And so that's how Carroll uses the notion of Aristotelian catharsis to solve the paradox of horror. In response to this attempted solution, you can see that there's an almost obvious objection. What about horror fiction that doesn't have a plot? If, after all, the only way for fright and disgust to be palatable to us is if it occurs in a certain plot structure, what about horror fiction that doesn't have a plot structure? Now at first that may seem weird. What do you mean horror without a plot? All, all fiction has a plot. Not so. Consider a painting, like this one. It's a static image. 
of something horrifying, Saturn devouring his children. It's actually on the cover of this uh, book, on Carol's book. Where's the plot in that? Well, there is no plot because nothing happens, right? And if we consider frightening art in general that doesn't move or doesn't have any text, well, the problem seems to arise quite clearly. If Carol is right, there should be something about this visual art that makes its frightful and disgusting appearance palatable to us. Carol says that it must be the plot of the thing, but it has no plot. We might phrase the objection this way. We'll call it the non-narrative horror objection to Carol. First, if Carol's solution to the paradox of horror is correct, then all horror fiction has a plot of some kind. Second, but not all horror fiction has a plot of some kind. Consider horrifying paintings, or maybe horrifying music even. So, Carol's solution to the paradox of horror is not correct. That's the objection. Now, there are two ways to try to respond to this objection on Carol's behalf. Um, he considers both of them in the book. One of them is to insist that, despite their static structure, paintings and sculptures and other visual media do have a plot. Paintings do tell a story. The name of this painting is Saturn Devouring His Children. There's a gerund in the title, even. Something is happening. As a viewer, you might only see one image, but upon seeing it, you are made to imagine a certain set of events playing out. You're made to imagine a story just by the depiction of this static part of it. That's one way to handle the objection, is to say that paintings do tell a story. Sculptures do tell a story. Static art does tell a story, and if it tells a story, it can have a plot. Horrifying paintings and horrifying sculptures, they tell a little bit of a scary story. That's one way to try to address the objection, anyway. The other way is to focus on something besides the plot. Carroll also does this a bit. If you read his chapter on plotting horror and what it is that makes up the genre, Carroll leans heavily on the idea of a monster. A monster, he says, fascinates us because it's so contradictory. It takes categories which are supposed to be exclusive, which our culture holds to be exclusive, and it combines them into something that should be impossible. So for instance, in our culture, the categories of being alive and being dead, those are incompatible, but a monster can be some of the living dead, a ghost or a zombie or a ghoul. Or being animate and being inanimate, those are incompatible, but you have the idea of a haunted house or any sort of haunted object, haunted spaceship like an event horizon. Or there's the idea that being innocent and wholesome is incompatible with being malevolent and sadistic. And yet we have horror movies about killer toys, killer dolls, killer children, killer pets, Things that should be cute and endearing suddenly turning sinister if given a malevolent bent. Or our cultural logic says that to be a human being and to be an animal, these are incompatible categories in some cultural sense. And yet you have were-creatures and beast men and werewolves and all kinds of things like that. A monster, says Carol, is something that fascinates us because of its conceptual impossibility because it takes categories that should not go together, and according to our culture, must not go together, and it combines them anyway. So the full explanation that Carol offers for why we enjoy being frightened and disgusted by horror fiction, it's that the fiction includes a discovery narrative about a monster, as I said before, but the monster is doing some of the heavy lifting and explaining the appeal. So it's not all about the plot, it's about the plot and the monster too. And as long as you've got a monster, maybe that's enough. That's a second way to try to deal with this objection. Personally, I think the first way works better. I think it's more interesting to argue that a painting or a sculpture tells a story than it is to just say that we enjoy being frightened and disgusted as long as it's of a monster. But what do you think? That concludes our short unit on the paradox of horror and three sorts of solutions to it. I hope you enjoyed this scary unit and thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.